Praise the Lord. But before we get into that, say with me, the Lord is good to all. The Lord is good to all. Especially to me. He's good every year. He's good every month. He's good every week. He's good every day. He's good every hour. He's good every minute. He's good every second. All the time. The Lord is good. And the Lord is good all the time. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah to Jesus forever. He is worthy to be praised. It is he alone that have saved us. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation under the sun. By his own precious blood, he entered in once and for all. Amen. Praise God. Well, you may be seated. We're going to pray and we're going to get into the word of God. I'm going to be um, beginning a series of lessons about um, what's coming. Or eschatology, if you will, the end time. Now that frightens some people. And if it frightens you, you need to get a hold of your Bible, dust it off, read it, and believe it. Because as believers, we have nothing. In fact, it ought to bring joy to us. If you understand what's going to happen, it should bring joy to you. Now, if you're not saved, that's a different story. It might not be so joyful for you. Amen. But we're going to be talking about that in just a minute. So let's, let us pray first of all. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to come before you. Thank you for your holy word. Your everlasting, forever settled word, which can never lie and can never fail. Thank you for the privilege of gathering around the word to be fed your word, to have the Holy Spirit to minister that word unto our spirits. Thank you that we are gathered together for worship and prayer and praise and fellowship and to hear what the Spirit of God will say unto us today. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. I trust him to live big in me today, to think through my mind and speak through my lips and make my tongue the pen of a ready writer that I may speak as the oracles of God in Jesus' holy name. Lord, I thank you for what you have given me and I thank you for helping me to present it in a manner that people will understand it and that it will be a blessing to everyone who will listen in Jesus' holy name. Everybody say amen. amen. All right then, hallelujah. All right, raise your Bibles with me. Well, raise your Bibles and say with me, this is my Bible. Is my Bible. It, is it is the Word of God. It is God speaking to me. Speaking. His purpose is to bless me, to, bless to change me, to change and be glorified through my life. Therefore, I set myself in agreement with his word by having a receptive heart and a readiness of mind to receive. And by being a doer of the word I hear and not a hearer only, 
I realize that obedience to God's word is essential in order to have God's best for my life. Amen. If you study the scriptures, then you will know that we're living in the last days. And you will know that um, God has certain events that are scheduled that's going to happen on this earth um, in the near future. Some of it, which we'll talk about a little bit today, um, but um, it could happen, some of it could happen any moment. And some of it is going to happen beyond that. But, um, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk today about the next thing that's on God's calendar. The title is not the next thing that's on God's calendar. I'm telling you that that's what we're talking about. The next thing on God's calendar of events. And so the next thing on God's calendar of events is the rapture of the church. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now you'll need to listen and you'll need to really pay attention to get a hold of everything the Lord wants to say to us today. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to take you through a number of passages of Scripture. And we're going to talk about the rapture of the church. There are many in the body of Christ that don't understand um, the difference between what we call the second coming of Christ and, and, the, and what we call the rapture of the church. They are not the same thing. The rapture is when Jesus comes to the earth, but he's not going to come on the earth. He's going to come to the earth, and he's going to take those of us who are every believer that's here is going to go up and meet him in the air. That is called the rapture. Now, the word rapture is not in the scripture. Uh, the word in English is not, we don't have that. But there is a word that means, it's called harpazo. And that's, that's the, what we mean when we say rapture. And it actually means to uh, be snatched out or snatched away. And I'm going to begin today talking about that. Now let me just go quickly and just tell you this. There is the rapture. Well, look, before I say that, let me tell you this. Now, among scholars, there are, there are many people who believe different things. For instance, there are those who believe that um, this rapture is going to take place before the tribulation period. Then there are those, and those we call those pre-tribulationists. Then there are those who believe that the rapture is going to take place in the middle of the tribulation. Now we're going to be talking about the tribulation period later. We, don't, we can't get into that today. But that's something also that we're going to be talking about in our study. There are those who believe that the rapture is going to, or the Lord is going to come in the middle of the tribulation period. And then, so they, they're called mid-tribulationists. Then there are those who believe that he's going to come at the end of the tribulation period. I believe he's going to come at the end as well, but not in the rapture. That is the second coming. 
at the end of the seven year tribulation period, of which we'll talk about later, the Lord is definitely going to come to the according to the scriptures, and we'll, we'll look at all that, and you'll see for yourself that that's, he's going to do that, but he ain't coming for, no, he's not coming for the church at the end. Those who believe that, they're called post-tribulationists. So you have pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. What do you pass pre-trib? I believe it's going to happen before the tribulation period. And I'll prove it to you later. In fact, when we study the scripture, we're gonna see, we can see when the tribulation period actually starts. It starts at a certain time. The Bible shows us when it starts. It shows us how long it lasts. It lasts for seven years, is referred to as Daniel's 70th week. Jesus spoke about some things pertaining to it, but also he talked about the great tribulation. The whole seven years is not the great tribulation. The great tribulation is the last three and a half years of that seven year period. Now that's far I'm going with that. Okay, so let's talk about the rapture. Now, you'd be surprised that Jesus actually talked about the rapture or told us the events of it without, he didn't use that term, but he told us some things that's gonna happen and when you study the scriptures, you'll say, you'll know this is what he's talking about. Now, uh, when Jesus uh, was about to die, he had gathered his disciples together and he, you know, they had what we call the Last Supper and he talked to them about a lot of things. And we're, we're going to go in the 14th chapter where he's trying to comfort them. So John 14, I want to start there. John 14. Now listen to what Jesus said. I'm going to read the first three verses. He's, he's encouraging his disciples not to let their heart be troubled. But I want you to hear what he says. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Now let me stop and ask you a question. If Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, do you and I have something to do with whether or not our heart is troubled? Absolutely. That means it doesn't have to be. You can allow it to be, but it doesn't have to be. Now he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, listen to these words, I will come again. And what's going to happen when I come again? And will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Now let me clarify a few things. When it says, in my father's house are many mansions, don't get the idea of some big house. A lot of people talk about they're going to have a man. Oh, I can't wait to see my mansion. Well, first of all, uh, he didn't promise you a mansion. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare, what? A place for you. That's what it said. So that, that word mansions, it actually means a room or dwelling. 
There are many, are many rooms or dwelling places in my father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now hold, hold, hold that. Jump over into Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Listen carefully to me. In order for you to really understand uh, this, the concept of the rapture, you need to understand some of what Jesus was talking about here. Notice in Matthew 25, starting at verse 1, it says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet, listen, the bridegroom. You have to understand something now. You have to understand the Jewish wedding. Because this is what he's really talking about. So to explain it, to, let me explain to you like this. So you can understand. In the, in, the, in the Jewish weddings back then, what would happen is the bride groom, after he had uh, and this is before, he, before they actually consummate the marriage or anything. The one that's going to be the husband, the bridegroom, goes away. He goes away. And what he's doing, he's going to his father's house. When he gets to his father's house, he's going to build a place, a special place for his bride. And that's where some people get the idea that the church is the bride of Christ. Now, my personal belief is that that is incorrect. I don't, I don't find any definitive passage that says the church is the bride of Christ. I know it's believed, and I know there are scriptures that are used and, and, re, and referred to, and, and they think that that alludes to us being the bride, but we never heard Jesus call the church the bride. Well, amen. Not like it's me and you today, Lord. Uh, but um, we don't. But anyway, I, I have a lot of problems. But but that doesn't matter. That really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we're the bride or not the bride. I don't personally believe we are, but. The message, what he's trying to show us, is what's important. So in, with, with in, the, in the old Jewish weddings, the groom would leave and go away. Now, no one knew, including the bride, when he would return. He would go first and go to his father's house and build a room onto his father's house, a place just for him and his bride. When that is finished, then he would come. Usually, it would be, because they never knew when he was going to come, he would be unannounced until he got there. But sometime it would be late, like midnight. You got the picture? You have that picture so far. Keep that in your mind. That's the idea uh, that's in the mind of Jesus when he's talking about what's going to happen. When he said in John, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. He's talking about us, the church. Whether you want to call it the bride or not call it the bride is, un is unimportant. 
just need to know that he's gone to prepare a place for you and me. Now know this, that Jesus, since he left, and we're going to see in a, in a little bit when he left, since he left, he's been preparing this place. The groom would not come back until the room or the place had been prepared. And then when the place was prepared, he'd come back into town and claim his bride. Let's go back to what he says here in Matthew. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. They're going forth to meet him now. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried. They all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins uh, arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Now, now think about something. These foolish virgins represents people who are not expecting him, not prepared for him. Now, it's only one way you can be prepared for his coming, is that that is by being saved. If you're not born again, I don't care if you go to church, I don't care if you pray, I don't care if you read the Bible, if you have not received Jesus as your own Lord, as your own savior, if he is not in control of your life, you have not received him, then you are not ready for his return. Now again, I said there's two sides, there's two parts to his return. There is that which we call, that I'm talking about now, called the rapture, that, that is commonly called the rapture of the church. And then there is the second coming, or is also referred to as the second advent. The second coming has to be, it's, it's called the second coming. It has to be like the first coming because it's the second. Second of what? It's the second of that which happened first. When, and during the first coming, he came to earth. He was born on the earth. Became a man. And you know, we read all that in John 1. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You all remember that? Well, he came. He was on earth. He was born. He, he grew up. He became a grown man. All that. He died. Now, the five wise were those who were prepared for him. The foolish were not. The foolish were not. And once the bridegroom came, the marriage, uh, the door, they came to the marriage. Those that were ready went in with him. Those that were ready went in with him. 
and the door was shut. The door was shut. Afterward came also the other person saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Then Jesus said, Watch therefore, for ye know not what ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You don't know when he's coming, but he's coming. Amen. Um, so now let's, I want to move to, uh, let's go back to John for just a minute here because I want you to see something again. John 14, then we're going to go to Luke. John 14. Are you keeping up with me? All right, praise the Lord. This, is, this, ain't, this ain't hard. This ain't hard. But you have to understand a little bit about that. Do you understand the concept of the bridegroom? He has referred to himself as bridegroom. But I can take you, which we'll do later in the, Revel, in the book of Revelation, and when it says, when, when the angel said to John, come and let me show you the, the wife, the lamb's wife. He did that. And he didn't point, he didn't show him the church. The lamb's wife was a city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. That's, that's going way out there. We, we don't have time for that now. But I want you to just understand a couple of things. I want you to get the idea that he's, he's going to return. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. For what purpose? That where I am, there you may be also. Now, uh, go turn one book over to Luke. Luke. Now, we're going to go to Luke. Uh, 24. As a matter of fact, you don't have to turn but a couple of pages probably. Luke 24. I'm going to read verses um, 50 and 51 for now. Okay? And he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now listen carefully. The lifting of the hands was not what blessed them. He spoke words over them. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now, uh, he, this is those who he had appeared to, his disciples and all that. This is when he's about to go up into heaven. Now, remember he had said, I go to prepare a place for you. So now, this is, a, this is after that. Now, don't, don't think that the books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are in chronological order. Each author was speaking to somebody else like Matthew was speaking to the Jews. You understand? Specifically. But anyway, he took them, his disciples, and they, they led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them. Just think, he's saying words over them. And it came to pass while he blessed them. Just think in your mind, while he's in the middle of 
saying some words over them, blessing them. While he was doing that, it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Now, now, now let's, let's go over here to Acts, to the book of Acts, and get a better picture of this that happened. Acts chapter 1. Are, are you with me so far? Are we all right? Let's read what it says. Um, <clears throat> let's start at verse 6. Chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons, or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now keep listening. Okay, let's keep reading. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Now we already saw in Luke that he was parted from them, right? So he was taken up. Actually, he was raptured. Right in front of everybody. He was taken up. Now listen. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Not one of those clouds that you and I can look up at the sky. No, it, was a, it, was, it looked similar to that. But it was a glory cloud. It was the manifest presence of God. That's what that was. His presence manifested. And it, you can read in the Old Testament, you see how the Spirit of God would manifest and become a cloud or smoke and all of that. Or the cloud would dissipate in the smoke. Sometimes the smoke filled the room. Now, now churches got smoke machines. Ain't, ain't, no, ain't no glory in there. So they got to they gotta plug something up and, and fake it. But listen, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now while they're, they're looking at Jesus, he's going up, just starting to just... He started, he had raised his hand. He was standing on the ground, standing on, on earth, with his hands raised up, started blessing him. And suddenly, a power just raised him up right in front of him. He was not snatched. He just went up slowly. Until he was, until this cloud came and gathered him, and they couldn't see him anymore. But while they were there, two men they were not real, they were not humans. They were angels. Stood by them. So while they're looking up, the two angels, it says two men stood by them in white apparel. Very often in the scriptures, when you, you know, people think angels all have wings and this, that, everybody, everyone, you know. That's not, it's only a certain kind, type of angel that have wings. Common, what we would call common angels, every day, do not have wings. They don't have wings. Now, Gabriel, or some of these, there's a few of them, certain types of angels, but not what we would call common angels that come and visit people on them. They don't usually have wings. They look like men, they look like people. Remember over in Hebrews, it said, be careful how you entertain strangers. 
for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Well, if somebody come in here with wings on, we gonna know. Hey, there's something different about you. We, we gonna know that immediately, right? But somebody can come here and you just think they're a visitor just because you don't know them. That's why I said be careful how you entertain people. You don't know how, well, how who's coming. Amen. Who they are. They look like you. They're dressed like you. And you think it's a, it's, you just think it's a, 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 a person just visiting or somebody, somebody or just a normal Another church goer of what have you, and it could be an angel. That's why we got to be careful how we greet people and treat people when coming in. You ought to make, make people feel welcome when they come in. Smile and say hello to them, and God bless you. Glad to have you with us today. Not looking at them like, what you doing here? God help Christians. God help us. Anyway. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Listen, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go up. The same way you've seen him go, you're going to see him come back. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. See, when he's coming, we're going to see, see him. And here's something about, one glorious thing about that. Only believers are going to see Jesus when he returns. Only believers. Sinners are not going to see him at all. They're not even going to know he came. What's going to happen is just going to be a disappearance of people from the earth. Millions are going to disappear and things will be going on just like normal, and suddenly people are gone. Not like in the movies, their clothes folded up and all that kind of stuff. They're going to be gone. Their, their, their clothes will be left right on that spot, everything. Everything will drop. They'll leave those, those clothes will drop right to the floor, Everything. Everything. Undergarments, out of garments, everything right there in a pile. If Jesus come right now, all of you that saved, I'm trusting all of y'all are saved. You ain't going, you know, you ain't taking your clothes with you. You look nice and all that. You ain't going, you ain't taking that with you. That's going to stay right here and you, zoop, you're going to be gone so quick. If somebody is in here not saved, to them, they would see everybody just disappear. And it's going, you can't imagine the horror and the terror is going to be in, part in people when they see all these million people gone. Imagine what they're going to say on the news. Millions disappear all over the world. All over the world. The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And so this is, they left that and went to what is called the upper room and, and all that. And later at, at, uh, some, some time later, the day of Pentecost came and all of that. Pentecost was a, a, a Jewish feast day. 
one of the, they had the different feasts. They had feasts of tabernacles. They had Passover. They had the feast of Pentecost. Now all those were feasts, Jewish feasts. Okay, now, I wanted you to see him speaking to them, and then I wanted you to see Acts 1. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians. I'm not going to get very far, but praise the Lord. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. I'd rather you understand it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Praise God, hallelujah. Are you there? Good, because every time I turn, I'm still looking at 2 Corinthians. But you're right. 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read. I want to. There's so much here, but um, let's look at something. Because there were those who taught in Paul's day that there is no um, resurrection. You know, the dead don't rise. Um, he says um, in, in verse 11, of verse 12, he says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? You know there are so-called Christians who don't believe that the Lord is going to return? Do you know there are some so-called Christians who are confused and they think that once people die, that's it, they're gone. These are people who claim to be Christians. But Paul said, how is it if we preaching that Jesus rose from the dead, how say some of you that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ didn't rise from the dead. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. That's all for nothing. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. In other words, if God don't, if the dead don't rise, if that's not going to happen, if that doesn't happen, according to what the word of God said, then all this is in vain. We've been spending a lot of time going to church, doing this, doing that, for nothing. He said, let's, let's go. He says, verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Those that are fallen asleep in Christ. Fallen asleep in Christ. He says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ. That means those that died in Christ. How do I know? How do you know that means they died? I'm glad you asked that question. Keep your finger right there and go back to John. John 11. What did, what did Jesus mean here? Um, what did Paul mean here? Let's go to John 11.
Um, let's let's uh, start in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, a town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now Jesus was very close to that family. Jesus heard that he, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not under death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. See, what he meant was he's not going to stay. He, that's his present status, but don't worry about it. He, he, we gonna, that's going to change in a second, and, you know, shortly. That's what he was saying. He's not going to be permanently dead. That's really what he's saying. But God want to get some glory out of this thing. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and go thou thither again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the light, night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. How many of you know Jesus is not really talking about daylight? Nighttime. All right. Now, verse 11. These things said he after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus, what's that word? Sleepeth. But I go that I may do what? Awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be it Jesus spake of his death. Does your Bible say Jesus was talking about his death? But they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, sometimes you got to get plain with you. Lazarus is dead. Did he say that? Lazarus is dead. So now I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 15. I just went, I did all of that just to help you understand the, the Lord sometimes the term dead or sleep was used, but it was referring to being dead. Now hear me, there's no such thing as soul sleep. That is a non-biblical idea and thought. There's no such thing as soul sleep. Your soul is not sleep. And there's no such thing as purgatory. That's another uh, doctrine of demons. And it gives people false hope in the, the churches, them churches that teach that purgatory stuff. See, that person is going in this place where they can suffer for a while or be there for a while, but you give the church so much money and after a period of time, they can get free Then later on, it was a psych. No, no, they actually believe. They actually believe that stuff. It's crazy, but they believe it. But there's no such thing as soul sleep. There's no such thing as purgatory. I can't help what other people teach. I'm the shepherd of this house. Praise the Lord. So now. Let's go a little bit further. He 
Jesus, if Christ be not raised, verse 17, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ, what that mean? Who died in Christ, are perished. They are done. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. They also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope, if this is it, we are of all men most miserable. Of all the people on earth, we are most miserable. But now Christ is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Who is the man by, by whom death came? Adam. By one man's sin, we were all made sinners. And by one man's righteousness, we can all be made righteous. Now notice it says, for since by one man came death, by one man, by one, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam, in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Do you get that? Now, I want to go a little further because I wanted you to see something. There's a couple of things, I, there's a lot of things I want you to see actually, but. Now, let's pick, I'm going to skip down to verse 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? People have that question. What kind of body are they going to have when they get up? He said, thou fool. I'm glad Paul said it. See, if I said it, you'd be upset with me. Now, be upset with Paul. He gone. He he don't care. He said, thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain. In other words, he's saying, the thing that you sow or that you plant is not the actual thing. All right, put it this way, make it clear. You don't take a, a ear of corn and plant it. Because the corn is what you want. You don't put the corn, uh, uh, ear of corn in the, in the ground to get corn. You plant seed. And that comes as a result. That's what he's talking about. I just used corn. He said, it, it depends. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be. See, when we plant the seed, the corn is the body that shall be. But bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body, giveth it a body as it has pleased him. And to every seed, his own body. All flesh is not the same, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Celestial means they're heavenly bodies. Terrestrial are earthly bodies from earth. 
I never understood why they call something extraterrestrial. Ex extra earthly? I mean, that's just, you know. I'm going to say with Paul, thou fool. There is one glory of the sun. Well, let me verse 40 again. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory, in its appearance, and, what, what, and, and all of, about it. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown. That body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. When we bury a person, that body is sown in corruption. But when it's raised up, when Jesus comes and is raised up, it's going to be changed. All right? It is raised in what? In corruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Are you listening to me now? So we all have natural bodies. When we die, that body, that natural body gonna stay there. But we have a different body in heaven. See that? And it's spiritual. There, there is a house where all oh, there's so many things I can, I want to say, but I, I don't have time. Boy, I thank you, Lord, for our new church. I'm going to make time. I'm going to do classes. I'm going to do teachings. I'm going to do whatever we want to do. Now, he says, and so it is written, the first Adam, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man, we already said the first man was Adam, right? Is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earth uh, earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We're here on earth bearing the image of earthly, of earthly people, of people, natural people. But then later, we're going to have a different image. John says that, that uh, beloved, now are we the children of God, sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. It doesn't appear, we can't see it. But we, but we know that when he that when he appears, we shall be like him. Just like him. For we shall see him as he is, in whatever order he is. That's how we're going to see him. Am I, are you getting anything so far? Uh, you're going to have to because I only got seconds left according to that clock. 
Uh, go to that clock. Praise the Lord, go to that clock. Then he goes on to say, verse 49, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So now, uh, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's why I ain't no physical body going to there. No, no physical body going there. The only um, one that went to Enoch, Enoch was walking with God. He, he went just as he was. He didn't die. He walked with God, and the Lord took him. Elijah also went up. He went up. He was caught up in the whirlwind. He wasn't caught up in the chariot. He was caught up in the whirlwind. There was a chariot, but he was caught up in the whirlwind. Y'all read the Bible, y'all just carry it around. So now, listen, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. What does that mean? We're not, we shall not all die. But we shall all be what? Changed. You're going to be changed. So that change is going to take place whether you die or you don't die. We're going to all be changed. See, there are going to be people I mean, if Jesus come today, we're already here. We're still living right now. We're going to experience a change. Our whole body, everything going to change. The body that you have is going to change into a glorified state. A body fashioned after the Lord Jesus' body. But those who are asleep in Jesus, they will come with him. We're going to talk about that later, next, next time. They will come with him. So those people who are in heaven now, loved ones and all that, that they're not floating around with wings and harps and laying on clouds and all that stupid nonsense. That's, none, of that, none of that is happening. They are very real. They are very alive. More alive than you and me. They are aware of their surroundings. They still have, they have knowledge. And I don't have time to get into it today. I can show you later. They even have knowledge of certain things that transpire on earth. Until my believers. For instance, when somebody gets saved, they know it. Yeah. Let's say somebody's mother uh, died, went to heaven. And then the person was not saved. My mother died and went to heaven, but I was not saved. Later on, sometime later, years later, I received Christ. She knows. Amen. Can I tell y'all something? See, people half read, almost read, trip over scriptures and everything else, but they don't read the Bible. You hear people, how many of y'all ever heard somebody say, I know you heard them say, the angels are rejoicing over one sinner that can say, how many of y'all heard that? Say, way back, way back, me, if you ever heard that. The angels of heaven are rejoicing. What are they rejoicing about? Hmm. The Bible says that they desire to look into those things pertaining to salvation. They don't understand it like you and I. 
Y'all remember that old song? There's a song in my heart that the angels can't sing. I've been redeemed. That's a true song. They don't have, they haven't been redeemed. We have. No, the angels are not rejoicing. People are rejoicing. The Bible, Jesus didn't say the angels are heaven. He said there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repented. And people took that and said, oh, the angels are rejoicing. No, that's not what Jesus said. He said there's joy in heaven. Among who? Those that went to heaven. How y'all here? Y'all, y'all went home already. That's what, that's what, that's where the rejoice, it's going to be, it's joy all the time because people get saved all over. Relatives and friends and all of that. There are certain things they know. And I could take you into Hebrews and show you more about that, but we don't have time today. And, and I, I, don't, I don't need to get into that anyway. So I'll, we're going to come back and, and we'll pick up our next scripture. We're going into Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. But I wanted you to get an understanding of certain things that's going to happen. Now we're going to all be changed. But we're not all going to die. Yeah, I thought you said the Bible said it's a point that the man wants to die. Yeah. Well, you want to stay or stay around just so you can die? Or are you, or you looking for the change? Hey, yeah, yeah. It's a point. That, well, well, yeah, it's a point that the man wants to die. You know what that scripture helps us with? It helps us understand there's no such thing as, um, what do they call that? Reincarnation. That's baloney. No such thing as reincarnation. But, but uh, uh, Lazarus died twice. Because he died, and Jesus raised him from the dead. Where is he today? He's dead, he dead again. Right? Well, praise the Lord. So he died twice. It's a point that a man wants to die. That's just telling us that there's no such thing as reincarnation. You're not dying. You're not living two lives and three lives. You don't have no former life and all that. That is baloney. That's just not, that's absolute, that's a demonic Thing. And it's something the enemy has sown in the minds and thoughts and beliefs of people so that they can stay lost because they think they're going to be back later and something else. Well, in that case, they don't need Jesus. They don't need to be born. Those that believe there is no judgment. You just keep being recycled. And in some, and in some traditions, they believe, you come back as something else. In India, they, certain, they wouldn't kill some, some that, because they believe, won't kill certain animals, dick. Cow or this or that. Why not? Because that could be somebody, you know that, died and they came back. Long lost Uncle Lane, I'll tell him what they believe. But y'all start to death if you want to. Cut that thing up. And let's have some steaks. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> we'll pick up uh, further next time. Now we're going to get to the stuff. I want you, I want to lay, out, uh, uh, lay the groundwork out first. Okay? Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. And now we'll, we'll get, next time we'll, we'll get back in there. We'll get into what Paul said is going to happen. The Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout. Tell you why he had to write. 
he had to write uh, Second Thessalonians, that letter, because those people were all upset because people were dying. But we'll talk about that. And they believed something, they had missed the rapture and all that kind of stuff. But we'll talk about that later. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the things we were able to bring out. Thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, thank you for piquing the curiosity and the desire to know more and learn. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, there may be somebody watching who don't know you, who don't know the Lord Jesus as, as, as Savior. May this stir them to invite Jesus into their heart, to surrender themselves, to say to him, I am a sinner in the need of a Savior. I cannot save myself, and I recognize that. Jesus is the only one that can save me because he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man come to the Father but by me. And may they say, oh Lord, I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe you raised him from the dead. I'll give my life to him right now. I turn away from my life of sin and I surrender my life to Christ to live for him as he would have me to live. I renounce, reject, and do away with the former life. And I receive Jesus as my Lord, my Savior, and my new life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. All right, God bless you. Lift your hands and give him praise, everybody.